Welcome to the Opportunity Zones podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Atkinson. And today we're going to undergo a discussion all about housing abundance and job creation and how Opportunity Zones can help fulfill both of those things. Joining me today on the show to discuss those topics and more is Brad Padden, founder and CEO of Housing Diversity Corporation. And Brad joins us today from Seattle, Washington. Brad, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm uh, doing great today. Hey, happy to be here with you, Brad. We only just met <laughs> on this Zoom call of, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, I can't believe we haven't uh, interacted before because it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of work in OZs, but uh, really thrilled to get to know you a little bit better throughout the course of our interview today. Uh, let's start with who you guys are and what you do, the Housing Diversity Corporation, kind of an interesting name. Um, and I know you guys are trying to tackle a huge issue facing this country, the housing affordability crisis. Uh, as, as we were talking about just a couple minutes ago before we hit the record button, we have a current shortfall of approximately 5 million units in this country. And uh, it, it might be getting worse before it gets better. And I know you and a lot of others like you are trying to tackle that crisis. But what do you guys do exactly? Maybe you can describe your model of multifamily development for my listeners who may be new to uh, you and what you guys do. All right, great. Yeah, no. So uh, Housing Diversity Corporation, the name really uh, is referring to creating a, a diversity of housing types. And, um, you know, what we what we what we know about people is everyone wants to have a courtside seat and not everybody can afford to have one. And so uh, what we try to do at Housing Diversity Corp is is bring people that might be down in the up in the third tier down to the courtside by creating um, higher density lower cost uh, apartments into core neighborhoods, um, uh, very close to new opportunities and places where they might have uh, jobs or transit um, or access to things like fresh food, uh, that if they're living further out in the, uh, in the suburbs might not have direct access to. Um, and could you could go into a little bit more about the model that you're unfolding in Seattle and, and you've just started unfolding it in Los Angeles, and we'll get into the specific projects in a minute, a little bit more about the model and, and how you came up with it. Yeah, so it, basically, I moved to Seattle in 2012. Um, I came from the East Coast, um, the New York tri-state area, um, where throughout my life, I saw housing affordability go from uh, extremely affordable to extremely unaffordable. And um, in 2012, I had the good fortune of uh, selling a small business that my dad and I uh, ran throughout my life. And uh, I came to Seattle because I was drawn by the cloud and the cloud computing uh, and the explosion of uh, the opportunities that that brought. And I wanted to come to Seattle and create uh, some new types of housing to help uh, address this. Uh, what I saw was a mounting crisis uh, that was happening both on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And in, 2012, Seattle had just passed some new regulations that allowed for uh, higher density housing without parking. Uh, parking and, and density limits are, are, are things that have created uh, scarcity of housing throughout the country. And so Seattle was really ahead of the, its curve in that. And there was some great entrepreneurs who I was able to uh, watch and, and who mentored me early on and uh, gave me the opportunity to look at real estate in a different way and start to uh, create uh, much more uh, higher density projects uh, where before uh, density limits and parking would keep them uh, larger apartments, less affordable apartments. And so it was a really unique time uh, in the early 2010s, 2020s uh, to do that in Seattle first and then uh, moving on to LA, uh, a city that has a much bigger footprint and uh, uh, even a greater need for housing. Yeah, um, a lot of interesting nuggets in, in your last response there, but I think the, the overall theme was our housing is becoming less affordable and scarcer. Uh, I think a lot of that is due to uh, sometimes well-meaning regulations, but the fact of the matter is multifamily in this country is very regulatory driven, that industry. What kind of problems does that create? Maybe you can characterize uh, a little bit better than I did um, what, what we mean when we say regulatory driven. Yeah, I think, you know, again, for, for apartment buildings and multifamily, it really comes down to parking requirements and density limits. Um, small apartment buildings, uh, if you have to park those small apartment buildings, it's really very difficult. And so you end up with these large um, luxury apartment complexes simply because they can build an abundance of parking underneath them. 
Um, but what we need as a country is not necessarily an abundance of parking. Uh, we need an abundance of housing. And so for every bit of parking that we produce, we actually uh, produce less housing. And so cities around the country, uh, Seattle was one of the first, uh, began to lift parking requirements and uh, increase density limits. Um, so Seattle was kind of the leader in that, and that occurred again in about 2010, 2011. Um, and other cities took note and um, people often ask me and say like, you know, why do you think there should be demand for these small apartments? Um, and, and we know that there's demand if regulation allows it to be produced. Uh, the issue has been not a lack of demand, it's been a lack of supply and the ability to produce that supply. Right, and it's oftentimes those well-meaning regulations that produce that lack of supply that introduce additional scarcity into the marketplace. And uh, I think that's part of what or a large part of what's led to this housing scarcity issue that's unfolded all over the country, but particularly in uh, many of the coastal cities on, on both the West and the East Coast. It, it, am, am I kind of on the right track there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it can seem threatening to have, um, you know, to increase density and to remove parking requirements to some uh, folks, right? And um, I think one of the things that we find in our buildings is there's a, um, when we bring our investors through and walk through our buildings, there's this aha moment that they have where they go from skeptics to completely understanding why somebody would want to live in a 350 square foot apartment. Um, if they can walk to everything and it's across the street from the hospital and down the street from city hall and, you know, four blocks from a park and eight blocks from a whole foods. Um, there's always that aha moment and it's either aha. I lived in a place like this when I was younger or, ah, oh, this would be a great place for my son or daughter to come and live when they come back from school because they can't afford anything else in Seattle or LA or pick your city. Um, so it really does create new opportunities um, and, and this idea that, that entrepreneurs in the free market can help solve some of our big problems is something I'm very passionate about. I'm definitely, you know, on the side of the entrepreneur uh, solving the problems as opposed to central control. Um, so I'm not suggesting uh, no zoning or no regulation. Uh, but uh, sensible, workable legislation and regulations that allow entrepreneurs to do what they do in solving the big challenges facing our country. Sure. No, so, I, yeah. that all sounds great to me. I'm a huge uh, fan of that entrepreneurial spirit myself. Uh, so you mentioned about 350 square foot units that it does sound rather small, shockingly small, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, to, to someone who may not be used to that. Who are your typical residents in the units that you're developing? Are they working professionals? Are they, are they younger? Are they older? Um, I don't yeah. suppose you may have a lot of families, well, certainly not large families living in a 350 yeah. square unit or square foot unit, but uh, to tell me a little bit more about who your residents are, who you're targeting there. Absolutely. Um, our, our residents tend to be singles or couples. Um, uh, probably first, second, or third job out of university. Um, we tend not to get students because it's still not uh, super inexpensive housing. Although when I look at the price of dorms uh, these days, they're extremely expensive. Actually, you can save some money living in our apartments. But uh, we, we get graduate students, um, and the age tends to be between about 25 and 35 years old. So these are young professionals that are uh, probably trying to save money, pay off student loans. Um, we get quite a lot of um, people that have transitional type jobs, like traveling nurses um, who come and they, they're looking for an inexpensive place to live that's really centrally located and walkable. Um, so there's quite a large uh, subset of folks that love our type of housing. And I could see this housing appealing to uh, seniors too, um, as, as, as they, as they need these more affordable places. I mean, senior housing is a whole nother issue facing our country um, that hasn't really been solved. Uh, maybe slightly larger apartments with walk-in uh, bathtubs and things like that. But for now, housing diversity is really focused on these individuals and couples. Um, one of the things that I think it's worth mentioning is that you know housing is a closed loop system. There's only so much of it. You mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the shortage of 5 million housing units. You know, part of our, our, our plan is to help um, to help alleviate this issue of uh, scarcity of family housing is taking folks that are living in three, four or five bedroom houses, you know, a bunch of roommates and bringing them into the urban core where they can walk to work and share a higher density lifestyle and support the local retail 
And what that'll do is it'll unload one of those uh, houses that might be appropriate for a family because the cost to build a new house is so much higher than the cost to reuse an existing house. Um, really the old houses of the 60s and 70s are, are the affordable family housing that we need. The solution for family housing is not to build brand new buildings uh, with 2000 square foot apartments for families, it's just too expensive. Right. No, it's a, that, that makes a lot of sense. The, the solution might be to, to, to tamp down the uh, demand for that type of housing by creating more supply in a different category, which is your high density units that you're, that you're building there. Uh, wanted to shift gears a little bit and, hey, let's talk about opportunity zones for, for a few minutes here. You guys are developing in Seattle and in Los Angeles-based opportunity zones. Can you talk to us a little bit about the distinction between those two markets and, and what you're doing there exactly? Yeah, you know, both, both cities have some really great opportunity zones and, and we're very thankful for the regulations that came out um, in about 2018. Um, we've been following the regs uh, when they were first um, proposed, uh, followed them through the several revisions. Um, and, and we basically, we operate in Seattle and LA's opportunity zones. Um, near high opportunity areas of those cities. So um, our business model really focuses on placing people adjacent to high opportunity neighborhoods. And high opportunity neighborhoods are places, again, where they can have access to jobs, transit, fresh food, uh, parks, and all the amenities that make our cities so great. Um, so both Seattle and LA have some great opportunity zones. Um, in, in, in LA in particular, we're working in uh, downtown LA neighborhood, uh, Koreatown uh, and uh, Hollywood. And in Seattle, we're, the OZs are uh, a little bit more scarce in, in the urban core. Um, so we're working on kind of the south end of Seattle, um, including the Rainier Valley and uh, the Chinatown International District. Right on. Um, what, what would you say are like the biggest differences between those two markets? You got your start in Seattle, a little smaller yeah. market, big city Seattle, but but not quite the scale of of L.A. Are there any other big differences there in terms of uh, their opportunity zones and, and how you have to develop in those two cities? Well, I think you hit it on, on the head there. You know, you've got a city that's much, much smaller in Seattle, um, a little bit easier to wrap your hands around and, and kind of understand. Um, L.A. is a bit like the Wild West. Um, their land use code is less defined. There's a lot more um, variability in what they do and don't allow. Um, it seems to change day to day. Um, but see, yeah, L.A. is a 550 square mile city. And so uh, from an opportunity standpoint, um, as a developer, there's just a lot more uh, places to create housing and a lot more opportunity uh, to do so. So, you know, it's an interesting juxtaposition, the two markets. Um, but our, our core uh, product uh, is in Seattle, right? We have 2000 units in Seattle, approximately and um, about 1,300 of those units are uh, in opportunity zones. And these are projects that are under development or in the markets. We have both uh, stabilized operating assets and projects that are being built or in the process of being permitted. Good, good, good insights there. And uh, interesting to hear a little bit more about what you're developing. What about pushback on opportunity zones? Pretty much since I would say spring or, or summer of 2018, when Opportunity Zones first started actually becoming a thing, uh, they've been open to widespread criticism. Uh, I've been very recently earlier this year, Senator Ron Wyden of the state of Oregon sent letters of inquiry to a handful of qualified opportunity funds asking them, hey, what the heck are you guys doing? How are you an Opportunity Zone fund? Why should the taxpayer be subsidizing these types of investment projects? Uh, there's, there's clearly been a lot of Opportunity Zone pushback. Um, but the program at its heart really does have a lot of good meaning intentions behind it. Uh, what are your thoughts, Brad, on some of the criticisms of the OZ program and how do you guys steer clear of it? You know, when we developed the, the business model of Housing Diversity Corp, I think we were really trying to do well while doing good. Um, that's, that was like kind of a core uh, tenant of our business model was like, how do we solve a big problem while also 
uh, doing right by all the stakeholders, so the cities, the communities, the neighborhoods, the renters, and the investors. It was this kind of holistic view. And so I think that dovetailed pretty nicely with the OZ regs. I mean, when, when they first came out, we were reading things about, you know, the spirit of the Opportunity Zone legislations. And we've always kind of maintained that uh, one of our core tenets of our product is to always be uh, thinking about that spirit of the regulations. And for us, that means, again, creating opportunities for people, improving uh, outcomes of, and lifestyle improvements, um, and, and, and fostering uh, uh, housing abundance, and which is an issue, a core issue facing our country. And so I think, you know, if, if you're thinking about opportunity zones, and you're thinking about the type of uh, project you're doing, you have to think a little bit deeper than, um, you know, I'm, I'm creating jobs, I, I created this many, uh, you know, new construction jobs, because I don't think that that necessarily has the, uh, my, it doesn't capture the broad range, I think, of potential criticisms that you can get for the project. So we steer clear of, uh, you know, luxury and, and expensive or, or things like um, self-storage where there may be some questions um, from folks in, in the government that might be looking at that saying, is this really in the spirit of the opportunity zones? Those are good thoughts there. And I, and I think, you know, your product type in particular, uh, high density multifamily, that's <laughs> as we've kind of expounded uh, for the last uh, several minutes of this of this podcast episode, it's very much needed in this country. So it's going to be, uh, I, I, I think your projects, your fund is probably safe from a lot of that criticism that uh, some other developers may have opened themselves up to. Uh, what about social impact and, and measuring that. There's been OZ reform legislation that was introduced earlier this year that might uh, require some additional reporting and measuring of the types of impact that different qualified opportunity funds are going to have. Uh, we're not there yet. We don't, we don't have those transparency and reporting requirements, um, except for the very bare bones that, that we currently have from IRS form 8996. But Brad, how are you measuring your social and, and environmental impact that your projects are having um, even before any type of reporting requirements come into place? Well, yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, I was a Boy Scout and one of the, the core things you learn in Boy Scouts is to be prepared. So we, um, we've been measuring uh, using a third party uh, company, our impact and uh, doing surveys with our tenants to really verify positive outcomes uh, in, in living in our types of projects. Because some might say, you know, oh, small apartments, that seems cruel, or wow, that's too small for somebody to live in comfortably. So it's important for us um, as a responsible and equitable developer to always be testing um, our hypotheses because, you know, we produce a product and then we put it out on the market and uh, we want to find out, hey, did we achieve our goals? And so um, we've been doing uh, impact reporting for the last year. We have uh, an impact report already produced uh, to create a baseline for us moving forward. We're updating that again this year. And again, this is using a third party to ask our residents actual questions about their lifestyles. You know, how, how much did their commute change? How many minutes did they save each day? Were they able to sell their car and go to a more transit oriented, uh, walkable lifestyle? Um, you know, are they happier? <laughs> Have they taken on new hobbies? Those types of questions. And it's really, it's really interesting and also self-validating and it helps us to create a better uh, next product. Uh, project, right? Because we're always thinking about our next project as much as we are uh, finishing existing projects. Uh, it's looking to the future. Um, there's such a huge need for housing and we want to produce the right kind of housing for our cities, for our communities, for our neighborhoods, for our investors and for our renters. No, I think that's great. You're actually talking to your customers and asking them what they want more of, what they want less of. And I think that absolutely will help uh, everybody in the long run achieve a lot of wins, help uh, you put up more product type that uh, people want that's in demand. So uh, applaud you for your efforts in, in doing that. And we'll see what OZ reform legislation unfolds in the future. But uh, for now, it's good that you and I know a lot of others uh, like you are also collecting that data and, and working toward and making sure that this thing's actually working, that you are adhering to the spirit and intent of the Opportunity Zone legislation. Uh, well, Brad, I'll cut you loose there, I think. Uh, but real quick before we go, can you tell our listeners if they're interested in learning more about you and what you guys do at HDC, where can they go to learn more about Housing Diversity Corporation? 
our website's a great place uh, to, to start with at uh, housingdiversity.com. And uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect up with me on LinkedIn and uh, look forward to talking to your uh, listeners at some point if they want to reach out. Um, it was great talking to you, Jimmy. Appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to keeping you posted on what's going on here. Likewise, Brad, thanks for joining me today. And for our listeners and viewers out there today, as always, I will have show notes available on today's episode at the Opportunity Zones podcast website at opportunitydb.com slash podcast. There we'll have links to all of the resources that Brad and I discussed on today's show. And also be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to always get the latest episodes. Brad, thanks again. Thanks again, Jimmy. Appreciate it.